This is lecture number three. We will be looking at slides 22 through 30. In this lecture, we want to look at the first oracle of Haggai the prophet. Um, we will begin in Haggai chapter 1, and uh, please uh, go to slide 23. We don't know a lot about Haggai the man. Um, there's virtually nothing in the scriptures about his personal life, uh, and there's very little, actually, in uh, Jewish tradition or other kinds of traditional sources. We do know from the passages in Ezra that he was a contemporary of Zechariah, and you would not otherwise know that except for the mention of them both together uh, in uh, the book of Ezra. Uh, and also, uh, you don't have any really interchange between the two in the oracles in, in their books, uh, either Haggai or Zechariah. However, uh, you might notice by the dates that are given there that uh, they were preaching in roughly a contemporaneous period of time. In the Septuagint, in the Syriac and the Vulgate, uh, Haggai, along with Zechariah, is credited with the authorship of some of the Psalms, Psalm 138 and Psalm 146 through 149. Now, again, this is much later than the time of Haggai itself. The Septuagint, which was the translation of the Hebrew Bible into Greek, uh, occurred roughly uh, two centuries or more before the time of Jesus, but still quite a bit later than the time of Haggai himself. Psalms 146 through 149 are not specified in any kind of subtitle as to their author, although Psalm 138 in the Masoretic text, or the Hebrew text, is credited to David. But in any case, if uh, the Septuagint uh, tradition is uh, is reliable, then Haggai may have figured in at least one other part of the Bible other than the book that bears his name. By the time of the Christian era, uh, the time of uh, St. Jerome, uh, Jerome, who translated the Vulgate into, uh, which was the Latin translation of the Bible, uh, maintained that Haggai was of priestly descent. And presumably this also was based on some sort of ancient tradition, although we do not really know the origin of it. The uh, fact that uh, Haggai and Zechariah are credited with the author of some of the Psalms, uh, which is mentioned in the Syriac and the Vulgate, probably are dependent upon the Septuagint at that point. So this would not necessarily be an independent witness, uh, just simply one in a Septuagint tradition. And other than that, we don't know too much more about Haggai, except that it is likely that he was the older of the two. At least Zechariah, early in his book, is described as a young man, and uh, that uh, may not say anything about the age of Haggai, uh, but since Haggai begins preaching first, it would seem more than likely that he was the elder of the two. Slide 24. The oracles of Haggai are dated. Uh, you'll notice uh, in chapter 1, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 1, chapter 2, verse 10, and chapter 2, verse 20, that the dates are given with respect to the second year of Darius uh, and the months of his regnal years. And so th these are precisely dated to this year, 520 B.C., when work on the temple resumed. Now, you'll notice in this slide that the dates are really quite specific. August 29th, October 17, December 18. Uh, and you may wonder why those dates are so specific since this is so long ago. However, it's proved possible with the help of evidence from uh, really over a hundred Babylonian texts and also from new moon tables that have been calculated from astronomical data that we can synchronize this old lunar calendar with the Julian calendar that we are using in the Western world. And the results are generally, generally accurate to within uh, just about a day. And so the dates that are given here for the oracles of Haggai, and later there will be some dates in the book of Zechariah, those dates uh, are pretty firm dates, uh, even though this is such a long, long time ago. Slide 25. I need to spend just a moment or two talking about the translation of divine names. 
in the Old Testament, and specifically the way uh, the uh, post-exilic prophets uses these names. Throughout the Hebrew Old Testament, the most usual name for God is the Hebrew word Elohim. And this is what is usually translated just simply God in the English Bible translations. And this translation goes all the way back uh, uh, to John Wycliffe and William Tyndale and up through the King James Version and the various other English versions into the modern period. The uh, remarkable thing about the word Elohim in Hebrew is that it is a plural word. Um, That may sound uh, a bit odd to you, uh, that the, the Jews or the Hebrews would use a plural word to describe the one true God. Uh, but usually, uh, at least in uh, Jewish tradition, this is explained as uh, the God who is multifaceted, uh, the God who is one, but at the same time, he has many attributes. The one thing that is quite clear about this is that in the Hebrew text, when the word Elohim is governed by a singular verb, then it is translated God with a capital G, and it does refer to the one true God of the Bible. On a few occasions, the word Elohim is accompanied by a plural verb. And when that happens, then usually the word Elohim is understood to refer to the gods of the pagans, plural. Uh, either the pantheon of gods in the Babylonian or, or, or Assyrian pantheon or later the Greek pantheon. Uh, but in any case, uh, uh, it is the verb that differentiates between the singular and the plural with respect to the word Elohim. There is a singular form of the word Elohim, and it is the word El. And this also can be translated either God with a capital G or God with a lowercase g. Depending upon the context, then, El can be translated to refer to the one true God, or on occasion, it is translated to refer to a pagan god. And then finally, there is one more plural, which is just simply Elim. And this word is invariably used to refer to pagan gods. There are no instances in the Hebrew Bible where Elim is used to refer to the one true God. There's also uh, the word Lord that often is used of God in the English Bible. And there are two underlying Hebrew words for the word Lord. One of them is the personal name Yahweh, and the second is the title Adonai. Yahweh is a word that is used only of Yahweh God. It is not used of pagan gods. It is not used of the pantheon. It is used only of Yahweh God. And this goes all the way back to the time of Moses and the Pentateuch when God says, I am Yahweh. Um, The word Adonai, on the other hand, is a title of respect. And while it also is translated Lord in the English Bible, it carries more the nuance of the translations master or husband. Um, Sometimes the word Adonai can be used of Yahweh God, and when it is, then the L is capitalized. On the other hand, sometimes it can refer to a king, an earthly king, or it can refer to a husband or a master of a household. And in those cases, the word Adonai is translated with a lowercase l. If you look carefully at the two spellings of the word Lord, the one that uh, uh, translates Yahweh and the one that translates Adonai, you will notice that in the case of Yahweh, the English letters are all capitalized, L, capital O, capital R, capital D. This is a convention that has been used by English Bible translators for hundreds of years, and it goes all the way back to the older English version, such as the King James Version, right up into the modern version, such as the New International Version, or the New American Standard Bible, or the Revised Standard Version. Adonai, on the other hand, is capitalized only with the initial letter, and the other letters, O-R-D, are written in lowercase. So even if you don't actually read Hebrew, you can differentiate between Yahweh and Adonai by looking at the way that those words Lord are spelled in English. If it is all capital letters, capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D, then it refers to Yahweh. If it is capital L, but then lowercase O-R-D, it refers to Adonai. Now, I say all of this in preparation to talk about a very important title for God in the post-exilic prophets, which is Yahweh Savaot. 
This seems to be a preferred title for the Lord, both in Haggai and Zechariah, as well as later in Malachi. And you will find that ten times in the Hebrew text, Haggai uses this term, Yahweh Savaot. It appears 36 times in Zechariah and 23 times in Malachi. The word Yahweh here is the word that we've just talked about, the personal name of God. Savaot, on the other hand, is an expression which is a plural expression that means of hosts or of armies. Uh, some, uh, perhaps a, a little bit looser translation would be something like Lord of uh, all the celestial spirits or something like that. This seems to be a favorite word of Haggai and Zechariah, and you will find it uh, a number of times as we progress through this. Of course, um, it has been uh, sometimes transliterated uh, into English simply as Yahweh Savaot in some translations of the Bible. Uh, modern translations such as the New International Version will usually translate it by the expression Lord Almighty rather than Lord of Hosts. If you go back to the older King James Version or other older English versions, they will simply translate it as Lord of Hosts. Slide 26. As you read Haggai's first oracle, which occupies the entirety of chapter 1 of Haggai, you'll notice that there is a great disillusionment among the people about the building project, the building of the temple. In fact, very early uh, in the second verse, uh, the Lord uh, makes a comment about the people and says, These people say the time has not yet come for Yahweh's house to be built. Yahweh's word to them through Haggai was a challenge to their priorities. And in this first sermon, Haggai uh, chides them because they are preoccupied with their own lifestyles. He says to them, Is it really a time for you to be living in your paneled houses while the house of the Lord remains in shambles? Now this is what Yahweh Savaot says. Give careful thought to your ways. You've planted much, but you've harvested little. You eat, but you never have enough. You drink, but you never have your fill. You put on clothes, but you're not warm. You earn wages only to put them in a purse with holes in it. And so the Lord says, you need to think about this. You need to think especially about why these tragedies are happening to you. He says in a couple of verses later, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. And what you brought home, I blew away. Why, declares Yahweh Savaot, because my house, which remains a ruin, while each of you is busy with his own house. And it's really because of you that the heavens have withheld their dew and the earth its crops. I, the Lord, has called for a drought on the fields and the mountains and the grain and the new wine and the oil and whatever the ground produces on the labor of your hands. Now, it's important to recognize that this kind of natural phenomena the drought and the crop failure and deprivation. These are all discussed in rather vivid detail all the way back in the book of Deuteronomy. For these were, in fact, part of the curses for covenant disobedience. And Haggai's first sermon essentially is a sermon out of the covenant. It's a sermon that says it is because you have failed in keeping the covenant and in you have failed in following God's will that these disasters are happening to you. You are being disciplined by the Lord. The book of Deuteronomy indicated, back in chapter 28, that if the Israelites would fail in their covenant obligations, and if they would not serve the Lord with all of their heart, he would send them disciplines just like these, disciplines like drought and bad crops and deprivation. Now, of course, the post-exilic community is experiencing these very things. And it is Haggai's sermon that challenges them to realize that this is a theological issue. This is not just an issue of the weather. This is a theological issue. And in fact, it should remind them that it was for just these very things that their ancestors were taken into exile in the first place. Now they are falling into the same unhealthy patterns. Slide 27. So look at this brief summary of some of the statements of disillusionment that you find. 
We looked at this first one uh, in our last lecture, which comes from the book of Ezra, where many of the older priests and Levites and all of the elders of the families, it's particularly those who had been in Jerusalem before the exile and had seen the temple of Solomon in its glory before it had been destroyed. And when they saw the foundation of the new temple, they wept aloud. They seemed to be very disappointed in what to them seemed to be a very mediocre start for the second temple. Now Haggai says, you expected much, but see, it turned out to be little. They had high hopes coming back to Jerusalem from Babylon, but those hopes had fallen on very hard times. And now Haggai says, how does it look to you now? Does it not seem to you like nothing? And later, Zechariah is going to say, who despises the day of small things? All of this that's happening now seems so small to you. And so there's this great sense of disillusionment that has swept through the people. Haggai's sermon is is an attempt to help them realize this and to help them to see that the future can be bright with promise if they will simply turn to the Lord and keep his covenant. If they don't, their disillusionment is going to continue. Slide 28. Well, the response to Haggai's sermon was overwhelmingly positive, and it was immediate. In fact, when you look at verse 12 of Haggai 1, it says, Then Zerubbabel ben Shealtiel and Joshua ben Jehozadak, the high priest, and the whole remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of Yahweh their God and the message of the prophet Haggai, because Yahweh their God had sent him, and the people feared Yahweh. Suddenly, Haggai seemed to have built a fire into them, and they, even though it had been 16 years since they have actually worked on the temple, they suddenly uh, threw aside their fears, and they obeyed the Lord, and they were ready to start again. And so then Haggai, Yahweh's servant, said this to them, Yahweh says to this people, I am with you, declares Yahweh. In restarting the temple project, they could be assured that the presence of Yahweh would strengthen them and encourage them and protect them as they did that. And Zerubbabel and Joshua were deeply stirred to resume this work, along with all of the people. And so the work resumed on the 24th day of the sixth month in Darius' uh, second regnal year. So it says in verse 14 that Yahweh stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel ben Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, ben Josedach, the high priest, and the spirit of the whole remnant of the people. They came and began to work on the house of Yahweh Savaot, their Elohim, on the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of King Darius. What a powerful result from the preaching of this prophet. Slide 29. The general site of the building of the second temple is not in doubt, and it is, in fact, on the top of Mount Zion, this mountain that is to the north of the hill of Ophel, which is the old city of David. It's approximately the same place that Solomon's temple once stood. Now, there certainly were people here in the building of the second temple who had seen the first temple, and so they would have known uh, pretty much exactly where that temple was. Today, as we look back to that site, we are not quite so certain as they were, simply because of the intervention of all of these hundreds of years, uh, well over two millennia. But we do know that it was somewhere on the top of Mount Zion. As you look at this photograph, uh, which uh, is looking basically northwest over the Temple Mount, you will see a red uh, parallelogram, which designates approximately where the second temple would have been built. And in fact, it is right over the same site that presently is occupied by Al-Aqsa, which is the uh, the Dome of the Rock that was built by the Muslims several, several hundred years ago uh, and still is one of their most sacred shrines, the place where Muslims believe that Muhammad ascended up into heaven. There are more than a dozen scholarly theories about exactly where the second temple was built. 
all of them are within largely this square, uh, which uh, is now occupied by the Dome of the Rock. And some of them move a little further one way and some a little further the other way. Uh, and the various theories are based upon both uh, what little we have of archaeological remains and also what uh, brief references we have in the Talmud and other Jewish sources. The problem, of course, is that Jerusalem has been destroyed more than once. Uh, the Romans destroyed it in AD 70. They destroyed it again in 135. Uh, the Crusaders and the Muslims both uh, were involved in tremendous wars in Jerusalem. So there was, there was an incredible amount of, of destruction and rebuilding and destruction and rebuilding. So that means that uh, we don't have as precise of information as we would like to have. Plus, the fact that the Temple Mount is now a sacred shrine uh, of Islam means that uh, uh, scholars and archaeologists cannot simply go up there and start digging around on the mountain. Uh, that would probably be the beginning of uh, uh, huge uh, international conflict. So even though we don't know exactly where the temple was, we do know in general where it was, and it is approximately where this red parallelogram is in uh, the photograph that you're looking on slide 29. Now, the question may arise in your mind, why was it so important that this temple be reconstructed? I mean, after all, God allowed Solomon's temple to be destroyed. Maybe God didn't want a temple built. And yet, of course, if you read the prophets and you read Ezra, you know that God, in fact, did want it to be built, and that was why they came back. In fact, this is one of the uh, primary burdens of Haggai and Zechariah, and that is that the, the community that came back from Babylon to rebuild Jerusalem and the temple were not simply acting on their own initiative, but they were actually acting on divine initiative. It was Yahweh himself who wanted this temple to be built. Just having a synagogue or some lesser structure would not do. And there are some important factors why this was the case. First of all, God had chosen Mount Zion. You find this kind of reference a number of times in the Psalms. Granted, it was David who actually purchased the site uh, near the end of his life, a site that had originally been owned by uh, a Jebusite, uh, and David purchased this site, and he set it apart as the place that the temple was to be built. But by the time you get to the Psalms, there is an unequivocal testimony that David's choice of Mount Zion was also God's choice of Mount Zion. This was the mountain where God had chosen to place his name. And in a special sense, this mountain was a Palestinian representative of Mount Sinai because all of the various uh, symbols and uh, uh, powerful signs that at one time were attended to Mount Sinai were then attended on Mount Zion, such as the cloud of glory that covered over the place and the holy fire. So, if this was God's choice, if this site was the place God had chosen, then to build a second temple, uh, there really wasn't any alternative but to build it in this same place, the place where the first temple had been. And in fact, there was only one place. The uniform testimony in Deuteronomy was that when the Israelites were to build a temple, they were not to build it just anywhere, but they were to build it in one place only, and that place was the place God would choose. Mount Zion was the place God chose. Second, there is the centrality of temple worship. Temple worship was the very center of the faith of Israel. This, of course, is where sacrifices were offered, and certain kinds of sacrifices could not be offered without the temple. Granted, with the building of the great altar, they had already begun offering the Tamid, the morning and the evening sacrifice. But take, for instance, the sacrifice at Yom Kippur. This is the National Day of Atonement for the whole nation, which is described uh, so vividly in Leviticus 16. This particular sacrifice had to be done at the temple because it had to be performed with the high priest entering into the most holy place. First of all, with blood for himself as the priest, and second of all, with blood for the people. So without the temple, this kind of sacrifice could not be offered. So the centrality of temple worship was extremely important. And if the Israelites were to faithfully keep the covenant, the covenant that is described in Exodus and in Leviticus and later in Deuteronomy, then they're going to have to do that through a temple because that faithfulness to the covenant requires the existence of a temple. Thirdly, Jerusalem still remains the symbolic center of the nation. Not only had God chosen Zion, 
he had also chosen Jerusalem. Jerusalem, of course, originally belonged to the Canaanites, but when David conquered it and made it the capital of his nation, then Jerusalem from that time on becomes the symbolic center of the nation. Jerusalem is, as the Psalms will say, the city of God. And finally, in the oracles of Ezekiel, Ezekiel, there is the description of a new temple that would be built after the exile and after the destruction and abandonment of the first temple. The last nine chapters of Ezekiel describe in detail a new commonwealth. And at the very center of this commonwealth, in which all of the tribes are arranged in uh, various order around Jerusalem, the very center of this commonwealth was to be the temple itself. So even though the temple that is going to be built by Zerubbabel, which we call the second temple, even though this temple may not match exactly everything you find described in Ezekiel, still it is a very important first step toward this idea that Ezekiel has that there will be a new commonwealth of Israel. And so the new temple is in fact a first step toward Ezekiel's eschatology. So as we come to the end of this first oracle, It is most important then to realize that it is God himself who speaks through Haggai the prophet to build a fire under the people of Israel to resume the work. It's been 16 years since the foundation has been laid. Now, after this long hiatus, Zerubbabel, Joshua, the elders of the people, and the people themselves bind together in enthusiasm and dedication to the purpose of God to build the second temple. This is the end of Lecture 3.